Well, welcome to another episode of Fair Folk at Work. When people go to the fair and you ask them, what did they see theatrically at the fair that they remember the most? Some people might say, well, there was the queen. And other people might say there was a monger with a full bosom. And other people will say, there's these Italian guys wearing masks. My guest today is one of those guys. My guest, Jim Letchworth, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. I got to ask, which came first, Commedia or Fair? The Fair, by uh, a number of years. I um, went to El Cerrito High School, graduated in 1969, and my drama teacher was Peg Long, 68 was my first fair. You know, they're all, there's a big El Cerrito contingent who've done the fair. Stu White, E.J. Coford, uh, Joe Polino, my brother Drew, my brother Lee, uh, just, and goes on and on. So and, was uh, Peg the instigator or the enabler of you going to fair? Oh, the inspiration, absolutely. And she was just talking about this wonderful event that they had. She had participated the summer before that year. And the first year I, and I was in her theater class, but I also had a, a job as a junior orderly at the old Brookside Hospital in San Pablo. And so I thought, well, let me volunteer for the first aid booth. I did, and that was great. Got to see the fair. This was at China Camp uh, before Black Point in Marin County. And Peg and her boyfriend, Wayne Ward, who was the drama teacher at Hayward, I think it was Hayward, they had a, a wagon and they actually got a wagon down the, the gully there. And this was way back when people on horseback were admitted free until apparently sometime that year or the next year, a horse stepped on somebody's foot and that was the end of that. But anyway, I volunteered for the first aid booth and I was assistant, we, they had real nurses there. And uh, there was a little layout problem though, because the first aid booth was right by the hay toss. And we had these guys tossing bales of, of hay. So we had a bit of dust in the air. And I noticed that the cot was just over the wall with the hay toss behind it. And so once in a while, uh, a bale of hay would come over that wall and land on the cot. Fortunately, it was unoccupied at the time, but um, they figured out to move the cot. Wait a minute. Did, did I hear you say you both studied with Peg Long and performed with Peg Long and seen her at the fair? Um, yeah. Tell me more about that. Well, Peg was my uh, high school drama teacher. I started my senior year. I had been oh, taking public speaking and debate and counselor said, well, why don't you do drama? Maybe you can carry a sword or a spear. And I thought, okay, sure. Well, Peg was wonderful and very inspirational. And she would take risks on people. She cast me in a, the first show we did, uh, You Can't Take It With You. And she cast me as a father, relatively minor role, but I, I did okay, didn't fall off the stage or anything. And we had then, um, we did Richard III and they, she cast me again in a better role with Shakespeare, William uh, Hastings, who gets his head chopped off. So they had to make a little uh, model of my chopped off head. And then uh, for the musical, they did Frenian's Rainbow. And I played the wonderful role of Senator Billboard Rockins, who was a racist and gets by, struck by lightning, turned into a black man and develops and it's a good happy ending. I mean, it's just a Finian's rainbow, pot of gold, leprechauns, and, and racism. And this was like 1968. So that was a tough year with uh, assassinations, King and Bobby Kennedy. Uh, uh, she was, a, as I say, uh, a, a risk taker. And then at the fair, when I, I did work for her, when she did the sheep to coat, at that time, we didn't really have to have a, a character back when it was it was more you know we're in a new renaissance now and when we were doing the sheep to coat and teaching people with the drop spindle we had to use uh, we couldn't use real wool because that's hard it could but it's really hard and uh, so we used Dacron and Peg's uh, uh, boyfriend uh, Wayne Ward would say 
tis hair the dak from the Isle of Ron. That's what we use. Uh, that kind of thing. Pate was also, when she played the queen, she was, well, she was the queen. She just embodied it. Her voice was wonderful, her bearing, and a little plot with me and my fellow actors from El Street High School. It was her birthday, we discovered. And we wanted to, as peasants, come up and make a little present to the queen. And we got this silly chocolate birthday cake, which we hid from the audience. But when we presented it to Peg, it was right there, you know, happy birthday, Moo, which is her nickname, M-U. And she just played it straight. Just We couldn't crack her up. We couldn't crack her up. One other fun thing about those days was, I guess it's always fun, the after hours. But back then in the, the late 60s, it was wonderful music. We'd go around, we'd camp behind the booth. Uh, my friend Rick and Joan with their jewelry booth was a great camping spot. And uh, kind of wander around with my banjo from camp to camp uh, looking for music. Just a, a lot of fun. You can see why people did their best to try to stay over and sneak in without a pass. Was there any sort of acting tips or lessons that you remember from Peg that you have sort of carried forth and done as well? Um, certainly there was a lot that she taught that I learned through observation, just observing her with the high school drama class, observing her at the fair. Can you pass some of those insights or observations along? Oh yeah, try to try to you know bear them in mind and say you know what would uh, what did she do that 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 worked so well? Now was it Peg who was the first Juliet in the Reduce Shakespeare Company, broke her foot and then lost the Juliet off to Adam? That wasn't Peg. That was Barbara Reinertson. Barbara Reinertson was actually in our first Commedia, who actually broke her foot in the Commedia walking across the stage. Uh, it wasn't a pratfall or anything? It was not. It was just simply it was simply walking. She goes up to Ed, who was playing Arlecchino, and as, leans on him and says, she says, I, I think I broke my foot. <laughs> so we, we had to figure out how to finish the show. And then uh, next week she came back and uh, we got a cart. We hauled her through the streets uh, in a cart with her cast. Well, we seem to have wandered a bit afar. If you were asked to sum up what Peg brought to both your acting education and your fair experience, how would you do that? Actually, you make me think of a photograph that she had in her office at the high school. And it was a picture of her on stage, big stage, a, a production. She was a young woman. It was, I don't recall just what the, the play was, but it was a period piece. She had a long gown on. There was Peg. And so it was the idea, maybe I could get there someday. Maybe I could be in a full production in costume on a stage. It stuck. Well, Jim, thanks for indulging me with the uh, Peg Long stories. I really appreciate it. But uh, let's get back to you at the fair. So my girlfriend at the time was working for a jeweler uh, at the fair, got a, a real job. And uh, the next year I uh, joined her and the uh, jeweler Rick and Joan uh, Fernandez were great, great folks. They lived up in uh, Albion by Mendocino. Albion, sort of a hippie ridge up there. I guess it still is. So let's see. Then I married Helen, who was another El Cerrito person, but got divorced from her. And so when I got divorced, I thought, well, what do I want to do? I was 25 years old. I said, well, I really want to go back and be an actor and study theater. So I went down to Santa Cruz at to Cabrillo College and took some uh, wonderful classes, of one of which was about Commedia dell'arte, taught by Judy Slotum. And I was introduced to uh, the Commedia dell'arte and Pantalone and the old man. And I said, well, this is great. I can play this guy forever. And uh, I, well, I still do sometimes. Do you have any, other than flying hay bales, do you have any specific memories of the first couple of years at fair that made you say, 
this is what I want to keep doing? Yes, but I wanted to do it uh, as an actor. Yeah, the selling selling jewelry was fine. Got to see it was fine. Um, I worked with uh, with Peg and uh, the Sheep the Coat, or maybe it was pre Sheep the Coat days, and that was fun interactions with people. I do recall one day, so we were down by, this was at Black Point, by the Inn Yard stage, which is where the Sheep to Coat was, and it was really crowded. And I would hear a slap sound, and uh, people were jumping up in the air through the crowd. Somebody would jump here, and somebody would jump a little further down, another slap and a jump. And well, it was, uh, it was a Commedia dell'arte going through. And I think it was Theater of Marbles. I think uh, John Acorn and uh, Marilyn Prince and uh, some other folks. I never did see them. It was too darn crowded. But I thought, well, this is just, this is wonderful. Somehow I missed seeing their show that year, but watch what they did with the crowd was very enticing. And so I, uh, I put two and two together. And I said, this is a great form to take to the fair. You said something that caught my ear, and you said you wanted to do fair as an actor. Right. And that brings to mind one of the distinctions, sort of how I did fair and how, say, actors would do fair. We were sort of happy peasants, but we didn't really try to convince people that we were peasants. Fair was our playground, and we used it as such. And then there are people like the Commedia and perhaps the nobles and the queen, that actually seem to inhabit their roles. Do you think that distinction makes sense? I, I understand what you're saying, although I... Uh, yeah. Feel free to disagree or tell me I'm wrong. Oh, no, 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 I, that, that does make sense, because people do it. One of the great things about uh, the fair, and I still use the article, the, a lot of people <laughs> just drop that. It's like people in LA, they talk about the 101, the five, uh, up in Northern California, it's like, you know, no. Uh, so that's, that's kind of interesting with the fair. I don't know if that's a geographical thing or a cultural thing. Uh, one of the things that strikes me uh, there is uh, Phyllis, she had changed the English language. She changed the spelling of the word fair by adding the E, and now it's common usage. And I think that that is uh, directly attributable to her. And I, I think that that's really cool. But to come back to your point, there's a whole lot of different cultures, people coming from different areas, work at the fair, to play at the fair. You know, it's been called a, a refuge for people with liberal arts degrees. So there's a lot of smart folks and with all sorts of different backgrounds. And they, they come, you know, for different reasons. Uh, I liked to do it as an actor because I didn't have to be the producer. The audience was there. All I had to do was gather them and, and try to keep them entertained. And, and if they weren't entertained, they'd walk away and get a beer. So I did end up working in the office for uh, several years and um, participated in, in some of that. And that was actually a great experience, too. What did but you I do for that fair? I uh, got hired into like the least appropriate job. I got to do data entry as a non-typist for Ernie. This was about, let's see, that we came in as Comedia in, um, in 79 and end of that year. And then in 1980, my girlfriend, Marilyn uh, Prince at the time, and I uh, got hired in the office. Marilyn was working uh, with Dory. Kevin Brown was uh, Dory's assistant. Mitchell Sandler was the music and dance coordinator. And, um, I was uh, Ernie's assistant and did a lot, learned a lot of uh, production stuff too. And I had some training because I had had, not only was the training down at uh, Cabrillo College, but I had done the ACT Summer Congress. I was one of the older students at uh, 23 or 24. And uh, so that was a great experience and got to do, they were very costume accents, history and period styles, production. Bill Ball came and talked to the students. And so there was a very thorough introduction into theater. And so I carried a lot of that stuff with me. I still do today, the lessons I learned. I want to pick up on something you said about the fair doing the production stuff and providing us with an audience wanting to play. I think even then, I recognize 
that I was being given a gift of an audience that was continually filtering through. And exactly as you said, if they were bored, they would just walk away. That's why I kept going back to FAIR was that it provided me with an audience. And what I didn't realize at the time was how hard it was to attract an audience that was there and wanting to have fun. Well, let me uh, toss a couple of additions onto your point there, if I may. Uh, Please. One is in terms of the commedia. When we did it, my brother Drew was studying theater at what was Cal State Hayward back then. Drew and, and Ed Holmes, who later went on to have a career with uh, San Francisco Mime Troupe. My brother Lee and his partner, uh, Lee Grodsky, were jugglers. And Paul Harkness is a, another Hayward guy. So we developed a commedia and uh, auditioned for Peg. Well, she had two other commedias at the time. David Springhorn was doing a commedia and Brett Kuhn and Jillian, it was Jillian Bagwell, were also doing a commedia. So, but she said, you guys are good. We're going to have to fit you in here. Uh, three comedians and one fair. She said, what the heck? As a result, we had three different stages. So we did, we were on the main stage. We were on the end yard stage. We were on the mountebank or red barrel, whatever it was at the time. And we had to go in character through the street, coming down the hill from the main stage to the end yard as, as pantalone with my full regalia costume robes I had and my uh, my cane. So the old man running running down the hill. Uh, that and the audience reaction to that actually gave me a whole nother level into the character. How are people seeing it? Because that's, you know, what am I communicating? So clearly I was communicating this kind of crazy old man. Uh, the other point I wanted to make was an entirely different character because I did the Puritan there for years. And as the Puritan, one of the, my great joys was in Agora. I only did the one year down there, I guess it was 1980, the bridge. Everybody had to cross the bridge. And uh, so Puritan was traditionally on the bridge telling everybody to go home. And that was wonderful. That was just great because, as you say, the audience is moving along. And I got to use... I. Uh, did my research. I got quotes from Philip Stubbs, who was the Puritan's Puritan, really. And I would quote him. I would tell people, Heidi, hither, go not there. Where? There. Go not there. There? Is that toy? Oh, right, I'm going. Thanks. You know, I'd look for people with their hands in their pockets. And I'd say, gentlemen, remove thy hand from thy side pocket. What? Thou go blind, and uh, every, all his friends would laugh at him. And of course, the next group that comes, I get to repeat the same line. So not only do you get a chance to improve the lines and find out where the joke is, but you get to use it again as the crowd moves along in five feet. But an hour on the bridge was about all it could take at one piece. And one of the th the lessons I learned from that is that. The fair needed more Puritans because it's such a great character. And uh, so we were able I, to recruit and train uh, more Puritans. And that was, um, it's nice to see them uh, propagate. Let me, uh, let me uh, throw a little thing at you because uh, you, we talked about the Commedia a little bit earlier. The uh, Dottori in the Commedia was traditionally dressed in black because that was the scholar's robe. And that's why the Puritans robe, uh, wore black because uh, partly because they were scholars and partly because they wanted to be simple and strict. Well, our Italian dottore would often be mistaken for the Puritan. And so that was kind of fun. It's where he's had to try to set them straight. And it was usually the fair people. It wasn't necessarily the, the, the customers. Because if he was walking uh, through the streets without his mask or something, but had his black scholar's robes on, they, they would think he was the Puritan. So he would, he would have fun with that. On the day that we talked that it wasn't our official day. You mentioned you have played most of the Comedia characters. I have. I'm not going to ask you what is your favorite Comedia character, but what Comedia character most closely tracks with the inner gym? Well, Pantalone was my first love, as I mentioned, and my wife, Marilyn, thinks that somehow I'm uh, Pantalone's there. I got to play Scrooge at the last a couple of Dickens fairs, and so he's a direct descendant of Pantalone. And again, my, my wife thinks I was 
probably type cast, but could be, could be. I did start playing Arlecchino because Marilyn is a perfect Colombina. And I wanted to play opposite my wife. And besides that, we got to do a lot of other things because we did a lot of commedia that was outside of the fair. It was great to do it for the fair, but we got to do Italian parties or Italian theme festivals or Renaissance theme festivals or conventions. So Arlecchino and Colombina as a traditional couple get to do a lot of stuff that way. But I like them all. But one of the things about the Commedia is that they're, you know, it's all aspects of each of us. So it's Capitano with the false bravado, Brighella with his scheming, Arlecchino with his simplistic, in the moment, childlike, il dottore, and I am a dottore. And there's a lot of dottores out at the fair. Lecture on and on, thinks he knows everything, but doesn't know anything. We're all that. And then, the, the, you know, Columbina uh, is, is great. Of course, we, we love teaching it too. Columbina Isabella are the two traditional women's roles, but there's also the courtesan uh, is a traditional character, a minor character. And there's uh, the old white witch, uh, the good witch, or the potion lady who lives out in the country. So maybe she's, you know, go to her for a love potion or something else, you know, a fake death potion. Uh, so those are distinct archetypes. And when we teach it, because most of the comedia characters are men, we want to bring in more roles for the women. I personally think that it's great with women play men, but I don't think it translates across the sexes. In other words, I've never seen a convincing pantalona, but a woman playing a man as pantalone works great. Of course, the mask adds to that. And I think that is because a lot of the motivation of the Commedia characters is testosterone. You notice there are no mothers in the Commedia. And the reason mm -hmm. I think that there's no mothers is because if we had mothers, they'd fix all the problems and we wouldn't. They wouldn't be so stupid. No, exactly. Because all the Commedia, as a matter of fact, a lot of their traditional names, the last names, translate to stupid in the, the local dialect. Regella Kaviki. Uh, mean, stupid. Besides, the smartest character in the Commedia is Columbina. She's at the bottom of the totem pole, the status pole. She's a woman, she's a servant, and she's the one who solves everything at the end, most typically. Looking at the archetypes, it's just a great way to, to look at it. When we teach the kids, they get to pick out their own roles, and, uh, and then Marilyn is the primary lead on that. But they, they'll typically pick, and to go back to your question, they'll pick a character that's close to them. So the, the, the smart kids or the baloney spouting kids will pick Il Dottore. The girls will, Isabella, or who's beautiful, or Columbina. Uh, sometimes the boys pick Isabella. That's great. You can play everything. You, uh, we teach all the kids to play all of the roles. And as I tell them, that's very important, young men, because there could come a day when you are trapped at your girlfriend's house on the upper floor and you need to escape in woman's clothing. And so you need to be able to come across as a woman, at least at night. Um, that's a piece of advice that I'm sure goes over well in certain schools and perhaps not in others. Um, I've never had it not go well. <laughs> okay. Um, how did you get into teaching Commedia at schools? Uh, that was Maryland. Uh, we had kids and we actually took a big hiatus from the fairs. When they were little, we put them in the shows. We had shows about uh, babies. We had one great show that we wrote. We called it the Changeling, which is actually an English story or English, Irish, not Italian, where the fairies come and they steal the baby and they put the changeling in the place. And the changeling is this big, ugly, hungry thing. And the parents think it's their child uh, and they try to feed it and satisfy it. So we put our funniest actor as the changeling. So we had the, a prop baby and the fairies would come and, and take him and leave the changeling in the place. And then we had uh, P. Lotzi with the changing the diapers and all this stuff. At the end of the show, uh, Arlecchino, he does believe in fairies stolen right out of uh, Peter Pan and the fairies bring back the baby. And when they bring it back, it's our little baby. First year we did it, 
our little baby was three months old and he was a hit uh he <laughs> loved coming out there uh and the big reveal here the, the 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 chairs and it was it was so cute and then so he did that for a couple of years so that was bobby and his little brother tommy he made his debut at six months because he was <laughs> born in November. and uh again that, it was great so we stopped going to the fairs to work because well the kids want to ride the pony again at five dollars a pop and so, uh that was not the only reason but we wanted to take the time to to raise them and so we got him in San Francisco public schools. And one year, Robert was in fifth grade and Tommy was in uh, first grade, maybe second grade. And uh, Marilyn volunteered to do a, a commedia with those two classes. And they were great. The kids were fun. They had a ball. Commedia is a real wonderful introduction into Western theater. The parents made costumes. We went to Goodwill and we had lots of that we, we taught them. and. At the graduation ceremony for the sixth graders, the kids that had done the comedia, there were two sixth grade classes. The kids that had done the comedia had stage presence. They were self-assured on stage. They were comfortable. They spoke up. They knew how to stand. Whereas the other class who hadn't had that experience were your more typical sixth graders. And all the parents and teachers saw this. So they hired Marilyn the next year. And uh, then she dragged me along when I wasn't working, but it was primarily uh, during school hours with some rehearsals at night for a production. So she did that for many years and uh, the kids looked forward to it. I liked teaching the kids. I prefer to teach college, which I've done, high school and college both, just because we can do a little bit more. Uh, is Bobby the name of, is, is he the eldest? Yes. Uh, Robert, formerly known as Bobby. Correct. What what character was he? The baby. No, in when he was got in the sixth grade and got to be in a committee and have lines. Ah, that's a great question. He was a little shy and um, he was going to help with props. Oh, well, that's great. But then he saw his friends be Capitano. And so he said, well, I'll, let me, I'll be Capitano. And uh, his little brother, Tommy, also decided to be Capitano. So, because we can have multiple, so we had multiple pantalones, multiple Capitani, uh, multiple Arlecchini, and they were, they were the captains and they were great. Has this assurance of being a sixth grade Capitano resonated through his life in subsequent years? I, you'll have to ask him that. Um, okay. He's actually a little bit more of a del Torre, to tell you the truth. Um, okay. And uh, he's working on his doctorate in uh, immunology, by the way. So some of it rubbed off. Oh, yeah. He, he, and, uh, he's a great lecturer. So there's, that's what, another del Torre thing. One of the things I admired about the video that you have online, and if you could take a moment, tell viewers how they can find it and what it's called and that kind of stuff. It's on YouTube. And I think if you do a, a search for YouTube of the two houses of Bologna is capital T-U-T-T-I, capital F-R-U-I-T-I, Comedia, with a capital C and two M's, C-O-M-M-E-D-I-A, and then in all caps, R-P-F-N. Uh, Tutti Frutti is actually misspelled. Fruity is misspelled, but oh well. How did you come up with the name Tutti Frutti oh, for your company? The fair gave it to us. One uh, went back when they had the ship on the main stage after the Drake show, which we got to do. I got to play a B-Walk chief and Marilyn was in that. Uh, we had the ship uh, suddenly on the stage. So we said, well, this is the world's best prop. Let's write a comedia for it. Uh, so we did as based on, there's an Italian precursor to the Shakespeare's Tempest. And we went to that and there's a, there's a shipwreck and a desert island and Circe or Circe, as I say in Italian, turns all the characters into pigs. And we were looking for a name. And one day we were at a uh, Italian restaurant and we had pasta, tutti frutti di mare, which means all the fruits of the sea. And we said, let's do tutti frutti di mare, which probably is a little incorrect Italian, but nobody knew, uh, which means the idea is all the fruits of love. 
and then it just they just got called us tutti frutti and uh, and it stuck so we're happy <laughs> what are some of the um physical constraints in performing a commedia out at the fair back in the day like the renaissance day the uh commedia companies would play on basically a four by eight sheet of plywood so all the action would take place in a very small space and there are uh, techniques that they have to take advantage of that one of the characters zani uh has this funny walk where he doesn't go anywhere but he's, he's using all this energy. So that's a great way to show that he's traveling within a little space. One of the things I noticed on the video was when the two ladies go out into the audience and they're looking for Leandro and they're discussing the various Leandro characteristics of the various audience members. Right, they're trying to they're mistakenly identify. No, oh, look, at this. no, that's, oh, that's not Leandro. No, are you sure? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they're out into the audience. That was very well done. Well, they were, they were great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was one bit that we also used was to go into the audience and look for our mothers. But I'm going to switch things up here and ask you about your real job. You were a nurse, right? I was uh, an RN. I discovered actually a long time ago, uh, uh, nurses eat more regularly than actors. So I did that and I had a wonderful, uh, a wonderful career. I was always interested in teaching and nurturing and, and, and helping. And uh, that was a real opportunity. I, I, I mentioned earlier uh, today that I had a job as a junior orderly, it was basically a I'll tell you how long ago it was. One of our duties was to empty the patient's ashtrays. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, smoking, bed. yeah, everybody. That was in the late 60s. It was a different world back then. So uh, the second year I got to do it, I got to work in the emergency room. And I got to do really cool things like take people's blood pressures and uh, help with bandages and I scrubbed suture sets to, and put them in the autoclave. And uh, I noticed that the nurses, it got paid decently because they had had a big strike in the mid 60s. Uh, you know, working in a female dominated profession would make someone an, an ardent feminist. The other thing that I saw is that they didn't have to go to school forever like the physicians. And so, you know, here I was as a teenager thinking, well, I'll be 30 years old by the time I'm done with medical school. I don't want to do that. I want to spend time acting. And there are a lot of nurses who do that, who are in the arts because of the fact that you can work nights and pretty much get a job anywhere. In a stressful situation in the ER, say, are there times when you slip into an Italian accent and go buongiorno or? No, no. I've done, we've done uh, murder mysteries and uh, we did a murder mystery on the, Napa Valley wine train for years. And I would often play, there were a bunch of different characters and I, I played them all. Uh, they wouldn't let me play the Grand Duchess yet for some reason, but uh, one of the characters was an Italian guy. And so that's all, that's improv, you know, what you're doing. You've got like, you've got your scenario, just like with the Commedia, and then you improvise your way through it. And so I did study some Italian and that was was generally very useful but there's always you know a person who's italian or speaks italian and i remember one woman said um i i'd like to see how much italian you know you, you speak <laughs> and i the answer was just enough to get in trouble mm -hmm. uh, which she appreciated i guess the larger question is working in with the public in a medical situation are there fair or comedia techniques you have used to finesse your way through a situation? I guess the one thing that I did, and that's related to theater too, is, is listening. Listening is highly important on the stage and in medical situations. I did a lot of, uh, in the latter half of my career, did a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with cardiac patients. Uh, these are people that had, they call them secondary prevention. So they've had a heart attack or they've had open heart surgery or they've had a stent. It was a great program developed by Kaiser and Stanford actually. 
the timing was like perfect because uh, as we developed the program, I'd be calling people the day after they come home from the hospital and say, hi, I'm a, a cardiac rehab nurse and my name's Jim and your name came across my desk be, uh, because you just got out of the hospital and I want to let you know about this program that we have for cardiac rehab. It is a uh, part of your benefits. If you got to have a blood test at the lab, you might have to have a copay for that, but otherwise we'll work by telephone and computer. I bring that all up because these are people who uh, are hypersensitive that they might be having another heart problem. And so I'm talking to them, help them to identify what's really going on. Is this indigestion? Is this your heart acting up? So listening is very, very important to that. And I, I learned some of the proper questions to ask, of course, and listening for the answers. Listening in terms of theater is probably the most important thing to do on stage. One of the things that we developed in the Commedia, when we first were doing it, it was like, all right, we'll put it together. Here's the joke lines, here's the choreography. And it was almost like a dance number. We do the same thing every time. Well, we got away from that because it's, how do they work traditionally? Well, they improvise. So we've got the scenario to be followed. But what you say and quite how you get there, that's not scripted. So when the, we first started to do that, we got the most wonderful compliment from a, a, a fair person. And she basically came backstage and said, what did you guys do? Well, what happened is that because we threw out all the scripted stuff, we were listening to each other. And so we were much more involved. We had the characters, we, we knew what we were doing and where we were going. We think we knew, but we got to listen to, we knew where we were supposed to go, but are we getting there? And that active listening brought the audience into the story. So, uh, and it was a great, great way to be able to make the connection to, because I wanted to try to do it like they did it in the 1500s, as close as we can figure. And that's what they did. And it works. And in a way, Mark and I kind of tried to do that as well. We knew where we were going, but how we got there was sort of dependent on whoever we were talking to. So we had to listen to them for them to inadvertently give us a cue to appear quite clever when we seem to spontaneously solve the problem, whereas it was really just listening and uh, anticipating it. Also, uh, listening in terms of a scripted play is so important. For instance, playing Scrooge, uh, when the spirits come and, and talk to Scrooge, he doesn't have too much to say, but they have a lot to say. And he, active listening, uh, which that's what I, I do. I really listen to each word as, as though it's the first time I'm hearing it, uh, because it basically is, even though I heard it, Yesterday, uh, I'm here for the first time today. And that listening is so important because the audience is paying attention to, you know, what you're doing up there. One of the great things uh, I learned over the years in, in acting is that you do most of your acting when you're not speaking. You do most of your acting in the pauses and that is a direct relationship to listening. You know, I think it's not dependent on the other person. I mean, yeah, working together, you can build and build and build. And if you have someone with more skills, uh, definitely you can do that. Uh, you know, music, same, same sort of deal, but you're not responsible for the other person. Okay, good point. I noticed looking at your resume, of late it seems you're doing a lot with dance. Yes. Talk to me about that. Well, it started with Fizzy Weeks. Back in the early 80s, let's see, my brother Drew was one of the founders of Fizzy Weeks dance area at the old Army Street location. And I think it was 78, I went up and volunteered, and I loved to dance. I had a, a, a wonderful time. And then in 79, we had a, a core of of dancers and an auxiliary, so more dancers. The core actually were paid positions and the auxiliary were volunteers. So he asked me to work with the auxiliary 
Well, as you know, in Fezziwig, we're, we're announcing the dancing, we're teaching the dancing, and we worked back then with uh, Frank Davis and uh, the Brassworks Band. And Frank got a job at San Juan Batista at the state park down there. They had a Victorian ball. And they, he got hired and asked me to come down and be the, the dance leader for that. So I did that. We basically did our Dickens Fair act down there, and uh, which was a lot of English and, and German brass music. And they loved it. They said, this is great. Next year, can you do a couple of old California? It's an old mission town. We'd like to incorporate some of that. And so they gave us some specifics. So the next year we came back and introduced a few of the California dances and tunes. And it just kind of went from there. And then in, I think it's 2007, Phyllis and Nancy Bechtel got together and did uh, up at Olympali State Park, a uh, an old California history thing. They had gold miners and they had the Californios. Unfortunately, they kind of forgot to do the PR part of it. So it wasn't very well attended. That's happened a few times, but it was a great melting pot, a great chance for all these different artists to work together. And I met Lance Beeson, what became Los Arbenos de San Francisco, who play old California music, great singers. We have two sopranos, two altos, classic guitar, fiddle, and a, a brass, and a crumb horn? Yeah, I think so. Group, that's where I've been teaching a lot of dancing. Late, we did a great program just this week, Wednesday down in San Jose. So we've done a lot of missions and a lot of adobes. So that's also a Facebook page, Los Arribenos, A-R-R-I-B-E-N with an N -A O S de San Francisco. This leads my brain to another point. If I were to look for a continuity between fair and dance and commedia, I would tend to say that it has an element of immersive theater. If you can speak to how immersive theater was, first of all, seen by Phyllis. And second of all, what have you learned about immersive theater through the years and how it has impacted you? Well, a, a lot. One of the things that we did, uh, Marilyn and I developed along with a wonderful uh, director, Gene Thomas, and clown uh, who's now up in Montana. But we developed an audience participation show that is based on Rostand's The Romance. Well, The Romance is a 19th century uh, one act and it became uh, the basis for uh, The Fantastics. There it is. I knew I'd catch it. And we would bring people up. We would use my masks. We put them on the actors. They may or may not have seen anything to do with Commedia before, and we would make them the stars. I am not a fan of people who get people up in the audience and, and make them the butt of the joke. We make them the stars. So we walk them through. So we bring a pantalone first. We give them a, a little bit of a how to walk. We give them a couple of lines like, I love money. And uh, then we bring up Dottore. And then we bring up the lovers and we, we set the story. We have a, the wall, which is a box, a wooden box, but it's, it's still just a box. We also in, incorporate the audience. One of the things that we would do is Colombino or Arlecchino would say, say you know, here their garden and the birds chirp and gesture to the audience and they chirp, 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 and the bees buzz and bzzz, and the gondoliers would glide by and sing. And we put our hands out to the audience and right on cue, we didn't hint anything. Oh, sole mio, <laughs> which is actually Neapolitan, but that's, don't, don't tell anybody. Uh, but that's completely Im immersive, where we get the audience up on stage and, or the people from the audience, the rest of the audience is partly, they're saying, thank God it's not me up there. On the other hand, they're saying, well, that looks like kind of fun. And then when we all, we're all working together and to a, make the analogy to the, the dance, we're all entertaining ourselves. It's pre-television, it's pre-internet. If you want an evening's entertainment, you know, if we're going to sing together, we're going to dance together, we'll read to each other. It's, if it's a party, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be making noise. And it's not just 
about talking and drinking. It's about having some theme, whether that's a holiday or a family occasion or a Fandango. I interviewed Judy Corey, and she basically credited Phyllis with that everybody can be a star and people come out to fair and you play with them, not at them. Now, Judy Corey, uh, I got to work with, of course, and um, also observe her as she worked when she did her uh, very famous Godiva. Yes, and uh, had the bosom that she put on, uh, the, just the whole thing. She was just so wonderful and skilled and open and inviting and very generous. One of the things that I did for years is Christmas of, of Fools. I have my Fools garb. I, it says Fool right on my card. I point out that that's professional. There's a lot of amateurs out there, but I get paid for it. So one year as a gig that I had over in Marin, Judy said, well, here, do this. And she gave me this wonderful bit, which I'll give to you. Uh, and everybody who's listening is take the 12 days of Christmas with a large group and then have them stand up and do the partridge in the pear tree, the, the turtle doves, the three French hens, and so forth. So they do it every time. And you give them the little physicalities, a uh, physical thing to do. And uh, they'll do that as everybody sings. And it, that's it's brilliant. It, well, that's Judy. That's Judy, brilliant and generous. Yes. I can just imagine people in the audience who really don't maybe not know each other settling down as French heads, just sort of wiggling their butts and waving their arms kind of thing. And it also works particularly well with like, this was a church group where they did know each other. And so we found that with the Commedia or like, as I mentioned, the, the show where we bring people up with the romance, it works either way. And if they do know each other, you get sort of an extra benefit. Well, I've kind of run out of things to say when you were kind enough to say talk to me and let me record did you think of any well i've got to be sure to mention blah 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 do you have a blah 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 that we haven't covered i think we actually covered lots of wonderful things great topics uh, great stuff on the fair yeah we're still we're still doing it i Oh, okay, we'll do the, what are your future plans? Or what are you doing now? What am I doing now? Well, uh, Saturday I get to play Italian music with uh, Sherry Mignano Crawford at uh, Cafe Trieste in North Beach. So we've been doing that, uh, and Ron Esparza, fiddler and mandolin player. So that's, that's happening in about once a month, and that's, that's a delight. So plugging into another tradition. People ask, well, are you Italian? And um, no, no, not really. But uh, with the Comedia, it kind of rubs off on you. With the Los Arabeños, we're doing, uh, September tends to be the biggest uh, month for us because they tend to have festivals when the weather's better. It's like hardly strictly bluegrass in October. It's also the uh, state admissions day for California in the Union, I believe, was in September. September the 9th, I think. And now, by the way, we're going to be working, now this is way in advance, but next Cinco de Mayo will be at the Columbia State Park because that's actually where the celebration began. And I've been researching the reasons. Why were these guys in California so excited about a Mexican victory over France? And uh, it had, actually had to do with... Uh, potential extension of the Mason-Dixon line. There was, so this was the Civil War, the California was a state admitted, 1850. The Battle of Puebla was 1862 in the middle of the Civil War. And there was a very good chance that uh, the South might win that war. And they were courting France as a market for the cotton. And uh, so the fact that the French got de defeated was actually quite important to the Californios who were not treated real well by the 49ers, I have to say. And there was a very strong fear that that Mason-Dixon line would be extended. There's maps that it goes right up to the, the border of California and it would go between Fresno and Bakersfield and out to the Monterey Peninsula. And there was actually a bill submitted to make the southern half a slave state, split the state in two, and the northern half free. So uh, it was very, suddenly it was very personal. 
I told you I was a dottore. I warned you. <laughs> okay, then I'm going to do the traditional closing now. It's a slightly improv thing. Assume that there is something on this planet called the Phyllis Patterson Lifetime Achievement in Fair Award. You have just been given this award. The band has been told to sit on its hands. You have as long as you like, but give me your acceptance speech to the Phyllis Patterson Achievement in Fair Award. Well, thank you very much. And in honor of Phyllis, I'd, I'd like to say, uh, it was a pleasure knowing you, working with you. It was a pleasure when we worked in the office, uh, Marilyn and I were often drafted because we were actors right, to do PR things. Uh, we'd done a number of those things with Phyllis. So we really had an opportunity to get to know her and, and as I said, work with her, um, as well as there was a lot of, there was a lot of stars. I'm telling you, I, I, I hope I'm in a, a large company of as recipients of this award. I usually don't do follow-up questions to acceptance speeches, but what was Phyllis like as a fellow performer? And she what did great. she project? I mean, what was her persona kind of thing? Her persona was very much what you, what you, you got what you saw. Uh, she, uh, I didn't put on a character, but she was was herself. And so whether she was uh, in, a, in an interview with a television station or whether she was getting up and, and being a performer, making a speech, she was herself. And that very much uh, came through. She was very smart. She was, I want to say all business, even though so much of the business was fun, but she really did come from the, the business side. And I'll tell you one, one little thing, uh, back in, um, you know, the plague is endemic in California, the, the, the bonnet plague. And when we were doing the Southern Fair back in the, in the early 80s, there was an outbreak. And she was very afraid of seeing a headline that says, plague strikes the fair, strikes the Renaissance fair. <laughs> Fortunately, that headline never appeared, but uh, that's a... Uh, that's my summation of Phyllis. Well, thank you very much for that, Jim. And thank you very much for the entire interview. This has been my July 2023 interview with Jim Letchworth on Fair Folk at Work. Questions or comments to Jim can be forwarded to me, and I can forward them on to Jim at djng at earthlink.net. Questions or comments for me can also be sent to djng at earthlink.net. Finally, if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on Fair Folk at Work, please feel free to contact me at djng at earthlink.net. That's it for this time. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.